Welcome to The How of Business with your host, Henry Lopez, the podcast that helps you start, run, and grow your small business. And now, here is your host. Welcome to this episode of The How of Business. This is Henry Lopez. My guest today is Connor Meekin. Connor, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here, Henry. Connor is with me today to share his entrepreneur journey, how his foot injury that he'll explain and, and share that story, how his foot injury led him to discover the health benefits for him anyway of bone broth and why and how he going from that decided to start his own bone broth co consumer products business. And to receive more information about the how of business, including links to the show notes page for this episode and how you can continue supporting my show and receive exclusive content and discounts through a Patreon membership, please visit thehowofbusiness.com. So Connor Meekin is an elite ultra marathon runner. He's a world's best wolf dog dad, as he explains, and the founder of Bluebird Provisions Bone Broth, which is North America's fastest growing bone broth brand. In 2016, as I have mentioned previously here, Connor was told by doctors he would never run again due to a devastating food injury, foot, not food injury, foot injury, <laughs> food comes in here in a moment, which led him to fall into, into depression, understandably. And so using bone broth, he eventually healed his foot and got back to winning ultra marathons. He quit his job and became obs obsessed with sharing bone broth with anyone who can benefit as he did. Today, Bluebird Provisions is sold throughout the USA and Canada at Whole Foods and online on his website. Connor lives in Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. Once again, Connor Meekin, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Henry. Wow, that was quite the introduction and bio. Yeah. Uh, as I, as I, I can live up to it. it. <laughs> I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. <laughs> I saw your product, by the way, in a Whole Foods in Manhattan. I was in Manhattan over the weekend. And I, I was, since I knew I was going to have this conversation, I happened to be in that section. And there it was. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, Whole Foods has been uh, a great, great partner of ours for, for years now. Uh, we, don't, we don't do a ton in um, traditional grocery stores, but Whole Foods, we're just grateful to be there. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, let's let's talk about the the story. I know you've told it a million times, but first of all, uh, for those of us who did not know, I had to look it up. What is a ultra marathon runner, and particularly your flavor of it is includes mountains, which is even crazier. But what is it, and why the heck do you do it? Sure thing. That's a pretty standard response. So an ultra marathon is anything longer than a standard marathon, so longer than twenty six miles. Now. Um, when you get to races that are longer than a traditional marathon, a lot of people end up running in the trails and, um, particularly on the West coast of Canada, we have uh, beautiful mountains, beautiful trails. So I was just always been drawn to nature and the outdoors. So I, um, got really into, to running, you know, with a friend before work back in the day. And before you knew it, we were decided to run a marathon together and then, our addictive personalities kicked in and we ended up, um, you know, trying these ultra marathon, crazy trail runs. And, uh, yeah, I mean, b before you knew it, we were, we were, we were hooked and, you know, doing whatever we could. And, uh, as listeners can probably see where the story's going as it does with most runners, I, uh, I suffered a pretty, pretty severe injury, uh, an overuse injury just from, you know, not being able to get out of my own way, really. Hmm. And so then that's when the doctors told you this thing was not going to heal to a level where you could do this level of running again. Yeah, it was a really obscure injury. I, I tore a bunch of like, kind of like ligaments off the bottom of my foot and yeah, Western medicine didn't have a lot of precedent for the injury. It's, it's very, very uncommon. And, you know, we're trying all these weird, you know, treatments with doctors and, and all that kind of stuff for two years and, and really getting no progress. It was, some of it was actually making it worse. So really? I was just, yeah, just like, you know, it, it's even like, sometimes it's hard to talk about now, but uh, yeah, I mean, I was fully, fully depressed and kind of just in the doldrums of life, uh, weeding my way through it. But, um, you know, I ended up just trying a more, you know, some people call it like an Eastern kind of like a holistic way of healing the body. Um, so I started, you know, learning about nutrition um, you know, specific foods for healing, uh, you know, tendon injuries and joint injuries. One of the things I, I stumbled upon, 
among many other things I'll mention, I was really like throwing the kitchen sink at this thing, but I, I found, you know, protein rich bone broths. Um, and, and some people were using them to heal, you know, ligament and, and tendon injuries, uh, similarly to what, what people are using nowadays. Like some people use collagen powders to kind of help with joints and tendons and stuff. So back in the day, I heard about it with bone broth and, um, you know, this was late 2016, uh, kind of just before it got, um, you know, more famous than it, than it certainly was. Um, no one was really selling it at the time in Canada. So I just had to figure out how to, how to make it myself. And, you know, before I knew it, I was buying all these funny, like chef's cookbooks that talked about broths and stocks. And, and there's this, uh, you know, there were a few other books about the, the, the topic and I started talking to chefs and, you know, food scientists and trying to figure out how to make like the most, you know, nutrient dense, potent, uh, beverage, uh, I could, um, wow. to, to try to see if it would help. And, you know, after a few months of really doing everything I could, you know, it certainly wasn't bone broth on its own, but, um, everything I was doing started to produce some, some positive results with, with my injury. And I just, it really just allowed me to develop a really strong conviction in nutrition holistically, but also bone broth specifically. So I got so, you know, passionate about it for lack of a better word that I just wanted to continue on and just try to share it with, with other people because it, it you know, it, it helped me so much. It kind of like gave me, you know, a, a big part of my life back at the time. And I, uh, decided I'd, you know, kind of quit my job, take a year and try to bring it to market and see what we could do. Yeah. And so it's interesting. Obviously I've had a lot of people on the show talk about similar experiences where you develop a passion in your case, it was because of what helped you with one of the things that helped you with this foot injury. But that, that's a big leap going from that and wanting to share it to I'm going to quit my job and start Bluebird Provision. So take me back to that time. It wasn't that long ago. We're talking 2016. What were you thinking? Did you think you'd do this on the side or did you decide to quit your job uh, or did you wait till you kind of develop the recipe? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I think yeah, it's a good point. You know, timing's everything. And I and I think, you know, my route of, of going all in is certainly not... Um, the route for everyone. I think it, 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 it works. It works for me because I have a, I tend to be more motivated when I'm, you know, the pressure's on and I'm kind of backed into a corner, but I realize for other people, um, it, perhaps it makes more sense to, you know, do something on the side, you know, in their spare time and keep their, keep their job and their income. Now f- for me, uh, I mentioned it was good timing because I, I have a background working for software and tech startups. So I, I got in pretty early at a, you know, a tech startup that was doing, pretty well for in Canada. Um, and so I was able to just like learn a lot from, from the leadership there and, and really just got passionate about entrepreneurship and, and, you know, being a scrappy startup and being resourceful. And, and after, after four years there, I, I knew I wanted to start some sort of business. So, so okay. the seed was really planted for something. That was I, even before the whole deciding bone broth was the thing you wanted to bring to market. Yeah, exactly. So I I worked there from 2012 to 2016. And, you know, before I found bone broth, even I I was really interested in in maybe some sort of food product or something. So I actually almost started like a cricket farm that would sell like cricket powder and stuff. So uh, yeah, there were a couple other ideas. You had bounced some ideas off that, that, that you had thought about going off and starting then. There were, there was also, there may or may not have been a sock company that I was uh, considering <laughs> st- starting as well. And so what, what, ha- is there anything that happened specifically other than, all right, this is it. I'm passionate about this. I see what it did for myself that, did, that led you to quit your career and start the business. Yeah. I, I think specifically with this opportunity, um, I, I could see that it was gaining popularity. So, you know, everything kind of starts on the fringes of the internet and, and some of the, you know, a lot of these communities were starting to talk about it and, you know, more influential type people started to surface up in their conversations. So there were just a lot of, a lot of leading indicators, um, for me that, that showed me that, Hey, you know, there's, there's something here. There were a few brands in the U S at the time that were popping up and starting to, you know, seem like they were doing okay with it. And, and there was really a bit of a gap in Canada specifically. So it was kind of a timing and opportunity. And right. I, I felt like I really needed to move quickly at the time. So 
I felt confident, but the, the other, the other piece of the puzzle is that I was a bit burnt out in software and kind of realized that, you know, tech startups and software wasn't really for me. So, you know, I'd, you know, w- would have probably left that job anyways. Um, and, and this just, you know, was, was a great way to do it. What was the reaction from friends and family about this decision you made to leave, uh, you know, yeah. you were starting early in your career and having success? What was the reaction? Yeah, people thought I was crazy. It's, um, you know, t- to anyone knows, like when you put yourself out there and start something, you're, you're, you know, if you hang out in these communities, you think it's normal, but it's really, really not normal. You're, you're kind of the weirdo on the fringes. So I, I was certainly that, and particularly with a really, uh, out there, you know, whatever, quote unquote, trendy food product, you know, there was a lot of blank stares, a lot of, a lot of responses that are like, Oh, Hey, uh, Oh, you're doing it. Yeah. You're doing that. That's, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so it's kind of, the, people didn't really know what to say, but right. I was, I was just so, so into it that I, that I ignored all that and blocked it out, which I think people have to do sometimes. Did you lean on anybody? Were there any entrepreneurial influences or or did you seek a coach or anybody to help you navigate those times? You know what? I have I have some of that now. Back in the day, it was really really my dad that I leaned on. So he, um, you know, kind of forged his own path and is an entrepreneur himself. Certainly not in the the food industry, so he gets it. And I and I think you know I was just so so lucky and and grateful that my parents were so supportive along the way because it made it a lot easier. I remember you know I would. I would call my dad, you know, a, a few, few times a week and kind of just tell him all the headaches and the stress and what I'm losing sleep over. And he would kind of, you know, talk me off a ledge and, and really kind of give me a bit of strategic guidance, which I really didn't have from anyone else. I had a couple other, um, you know, a couple other mentors from the software startup that were, that were really helpful as well. But, um, I, I really attribute a lot of our early stick to and success to just me, um, getting guidance from my dad and, and, the really nice thing about that is, you know, it sounds kind of, kind of, you know, uh, fuzzy or peachy, but it really allowed me to develop a deeper relationship with him, which yeah. is just amazing. Yeah, no, that's fantastic that you had that support and that it came from, from your father. You, you mentioned, you know, your addictive personality. And then I read, uh, I forget where it was that you said, I don't want to be average at anything. I got to think that kind of has been who you always have been. And one of the reasons why you just dove into this head first, once you made the decision to do so, is that fair? Definitely. And now I realize as I'm getting older that, uh, you know, it's a double-edged sword with that mindset. It can be positive, um, but it can certainly be negative uh, if not directed properly. Well, one of the challenges of that approach, you know, I, 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 I don't want to be average at anything often leads us as, business owners, it makes it hard to delegate, makes it hard to bring on other people past that initial phase. Is that something that you've had to learn how to do better or, or, or did you know how to do that early on? Yeah, you're actually, you're absolutely right. So I am great at getting things started. You know, I, I would, I would honestly say that I'm probably a, an average manager. I, um, I'm, I'm more introverted, so I'm happy to be out here doing things, but, uh, as you know, doing one-on-ones, uh, doing, you know, performance reviews, those types of things with, with team members, I find very difficult hiring again, I find very difficult, but as a, you know, as a solo business owner, you know, I obviously don't have recruiters or an HR department. So those are the type of things that I'm having to, to really learn as I go in the last sort of two years, really, as we start to build out our team. But in, in, in the beginning, the first couple of years, it was, it was difficult. You know, we were hiring people off Craigslist to work in our kitchen, our commercial kitchen to make the product and hiring, you know, delivery drivers and, and people to help out with marketing and, and everything was really like duct taped together. There was no plan in place. And it was, it was a hectic couple of years. I'm sure. Yeah. So now you've been a business owner for, you know, since 2016, what, what is being an owner, being your own boss, what does it do for you today? Yeah, for me, it's another, it's another tough one. I I would say certainly being able to make your own hours to a fault, but as you know, other business owners can attest, you, you, you really, it's really difficult to turn it off. So you end up, you know, maybe you're not physically working hours, but it's really dominating your thoughts. So if you were to add up those hours, I mean, it's endless. Now, 
I really do like the idea of making my own schedule, being able to move things around, particularly as someone who has other, you know, passions and hobbies outside of work. Right. Um, for me, you know, being able to move around and run and, and get in nature is really important. So moving things around there is, is nice. I would say, um, not having to, not having to, to answer to other people. I think, um, you know, I, I would say now, now that I'm this far into the business, I don't know how employable, I don't know how employable I am, or I would be in the future. So, you know, I, I guess those are good things and, and bad things as well, but it kind of goes back to not wanting to be average and, you know, frankly, being a bit of a control freak, which is also something I've been able, you know, been working on for the last two years. It's uh, it's certainly a, a work in progress. Yeah. And those are common traits, I think, of people who end up starting their business. And I find it, I found that initially that every day I got farther away from working for someone else, I thought the harder it's ever going to be if I have to, right? But, uh, but yeah, thanks for sharing that. All right. I, I know very little about it. So I thought I'd, I'd ask you, what is bone broth? Introduce it properly. And how is it consumed typically? Sure thing. So bone broth is uh, a protein rich beverage that really, if you look back in history, has roots in just about every ancient civilization. Now, the reason I say this is because if you look back historically, you know, thousands of years ago, um, our ancestors really had to be resourceful and couldn't afford to waste any part of the animal. So right. if they were out hunting, they would find a use for, you know, the the hooves of the animal, certainly all the meat, um, certainly all the, the organs were consumed. And a lot of times you're left with the bones and, um, you know, there's, there's records of pretty much every civilization throwing all sorts of bones and, and parts of the animal that maybe were not used for direct consumption, but they would boil these down and make some sort of bone soup out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that's kind of the, the long history, you know, and around 2016, it kind of came back in, gained some, some popularity in the, you know, the health, the health food space. So the way that most companies are that follow a traditional recipe are making it is you take bones, um, not, not just any bones, you need to find the right, the right types of bones from the animal. So for example, you want like a mix of, you know, if it's beef, like leg bones and like the joints of the animal. So like the because knees, those the are hips. bigger and have more marrow in them. Is that why? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You nailed it. So the marrow and all the connective tissue, basically to make bone broth, you're, you're, you're just harvesting, you know, the protein and the collagen out of the bones and marrow and, and connective tissue, um, that the animal provides. And, you know, the joints tend to have the most of these things. So now with, with our community, uh, I'd say around 70% of them, um, are what we call like our daily sippers. So they've developed a ritual around drinking bone broth. Um, you know, not every day, but a, a few times a week, and they will do this in place of maybe coffee or tea or, you know, an afternoon glass of water. They'll just have a, you know, a mug of bone broth, hot, now, cold. What, how does it, how is it? Prepared? Yeah. Yeah. So they'll, um, yeah. Hot. So, so you'll just heat it up. You know, if you have a mug, pour it in a mug, heat it up in the microwave or heat it up on the stove, you know, maybe add a pinch of salt or, or something if you're feeling, feeling spicy. And, and what and, does it uh, taste like? Oh, it tastes delicious. So particularly the, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the most delicious savory beverage uh, anyone will ever drink. So. Seriously. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when you're a kid and you have like a nice chicken soup, um, that's, that's kind of what I describe the chicken broth okay. as to people just like, a really nice, rich, flavorful chicken soup broth is is what we aim for. I see. And um, you package though. I think you had there's a powder form that then I add water to, or or how does how is it packaged? Yeah, exactly. So traditionally, when we launched, we have a, a liquid product and we uh, don't add any preservatives. So the the only way to get a natural shelf life is to freeze it. So I see. We sold froze, frozen for, you know, three to four years there. But uh, as, as I'm sure you people can realize, shipping frozen products across yeah. the country is, is impossible at the best mm -hmm. of times. And then when right. a pandemic hits, it becomes uh, really untenable for a lot of companies. So Plus I, for if you to get it in a grocery store and expect them to put it in a freezer, that creates all kinds of constraints, right? Not to mention getting it to them. Yeah, exactly. So getting it to them, I mean, you're going to use a distributor that's going to have their hands in your pocket, taking a lot of money. Right. And 
just merchandising it on the shelf, you're in a dark freezer that's poorly lit and customers, it's, you know, it's all fogged up and frozen. Customers probably can't even see your product half the time. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a lot of challenges. So I kind of saw the writing on the wall and worked for, for two years, really, right when, right before COVID started trying to develop a, a dehydrated powder version of our liquid products. So put a lot into product development and, and found a way to take our products and dehydrate them using a, you know, to get into the nitty gritty, it's a, like a spray drying technique. And then we, um, you know, have a nicely dried powder product that, um, it can be reconstituted using boiling water and just stirring it up in a mug. And then you have your, your cup of bone broth ready to go. And so we, you've been touching on it, obviously the protein, the collagen, but what are, what are the properties of this that have the potential health benefits? Yes. Yeah, so, so like you said, the collagen, the protein. So in bone broth, because it's made from bones and parts of the animal that we typically do not consume, uh, at least in the West now, bone broth allows us to get, um, some amino acids and nutrients that we really lack in our typical Western diet. So, um, call it collagen, you know, collagen powders are, are a, a great example of this. They're kind of like harvested in a similar way to bone broth. And they're really giving you these amino acids that have a lot of benefits for skin health and, and gut health would be the two main benefits, but there's, there's some new research coming out that, um, is really interesting showing how the amino acids in bone broth help with mood, help with um, brain health, help with sleep and help with blood sugar control. So there's some really, really kind of interesting things at the forefront that, um, you know, the bone broth purists might know, but the, the lay public certainly don't. Right. So if we go back to your injury specifically, how, how was it one of the things or what role did it play in helping you recover from that injury? Yeah. So, yeah. So the one thing I neglected to mention, uh, just a second ago is that, um, so the collagen or gelatin and amino acids and bone broth are also very beneficial for healing tendons, I see. much in the same way a collagen powder would. So if you drink, there's a, there's a researcher in San Diego that I was speaking to about this and he does research using gelatin, which is, you can think of having the same nutritional benefits as bone broth and, he, he's shown with, you know, professional athletes and, you know, just regular scientific research that, um, you can speed up tendon, um, tendon rehab and tendon healing using, um, foods like bone broth combined with a bit of vitamin C and, you know, a specific kind of exercise sh- strategy. So that's exactly what I followed to heal my foot. You, you fall into this category, of course, where there are purported health benefits. And I'm not saying that to undermine this, but, but you're, you're in that delicate area where you have to be careful as to what you promise, right. From a marketing perspective, certainly. Yep. Yeah. You'll, you'll mention, I didn't, I didn't mention weight loss. So that, (laughs) to be honest, that's the number one thing most of our customers use it for. I don't, uh, I don't make any claims about that. I, you know, kind of let them, you know, let the customers do what they want with it, but you know, it's, it's a tricky landscape now, because, you know, all these people are trying all these strange diets and, right. you know, there's even something called the bone broth diet out there. Oh, and, you know, know there's, <laughs> there's people doing all these like fasts and stuff. And I get so many customers asking me about all this and, you know, I, I just have to say, Hey, listen, like you can try it for that. I can't officially recommend it because yeah, I mean, we're a heavily regulated industry. We, I, you know, we can't, we can't make any of these claims on our, on our packaging because bone broth is such a, you know, really a new food category. There's, there's, there's no specific research on bone broth as a food itself. Now, what we're doing is we're extrapolating, um, the re you know, the, the components within bone broth, like collagen and amino acids, like glycine and proline. And that is what, you know, all the companies and, and, you know, myself in particular are talking about in terms of health benefits. So the challenge here with a product like this is when you, from a marketing perspective of bringing something like this to market, especially with, you know, you as the individual small player, you knew, of course, this was, had already gotten some traction in the States, if I'm following correctly, maybe not so much in Canada. So how, how did you figure that you took, when you took this product to market, how did you communicate these possible benefits, these health benefits. Now, I think, especially when I go to the consumer who goes to a whole foods, 
is a is a particular type of consumer, generally speaking, who is aware of some of these or might be looking for it. But when you started, at least in Vancouver, was that the case or were you evangelizing the benefits of this product? Yeah, we, we really lead lead with education first. And, and that's okay. really like our strategy to this day. So you really have to educate consumers specifically on what's in it. And you can, you know, let them know that, you know, there's, there's some, some, certainly some benefits for the components within it. But yeah, as you mentioned, you're, you're really walking a, a tight line. Um, so, but, but you know, the communicating of that benefits has to be to a big extent in the packaging then, is that right? Exactly. And, and yeah, as, as, as other brand owners in the food space would know, you have such limited packaging and such a limited opportunity to get a right. second look from someone. It's, right. it's really difficult to communicate that value on the package, especially given the fact that like we can't make specific claims in Canada, at least, and depend sometimes in the U S on these benefits. Like I can't say it's good for skin health on the package. Um, we can say, you know, we, we can say, Hey, there's protein in it, that type of thing. Um, you know, Hey, it's organic, um, for food products, you, you have to be very specific and just very careful. Um, and you know, you see it all the time. You see, you see, you know, uh, brands get pulled off the shelves for making, uh, you know, shady claims that sure. they can't. So sure. it's, it's really a challenge, you know, because, um, on online, certainly you have more real estate and, and more ways to educate, but when it's right. just on the shelf, when it's just on the shelf, it's really difficult. So you kind of have to use a real grassroots approach. Like for example, we did a lot of demos in stores to educate consumers and we would do events at local food markets and at, at trade shows and that type of thing. But it's really, I mean, it's, it's really difficult to, to educate one-on-one. -on -one. It sure is. And that, that grassroots events uh, or, or approach rather, that has to be very geographically local. So you started in the Vancouver area doing that? That's right. I would, I, yeah, the first two years are kind of a blur, but I would, I would, you know, package, <laughs> package and make the product from about 6 a.m. to 2. And then I would hop in our delivery van and I'd deliver to stores. And then sometimes while I was at a store, we'd have an event scheduled, or I would spend two hours and, and, you know, serve and demo, demo the product in store, talking to customers, really just trying to like touch as many people as I could, not physically, but, but metaphorically with, <laughs> with, with uh, sharing, you know, the, the, the gospel of bone broth. Right. And that, that really works in a, you know, you know, in your local region, you know, a lot of people have to do that to get, to get a start, but as, as you know, like, you know, it really doesn't scale. So no, it doesn't. Um, but, but, but getting into, we'll talk about in a moment how you got into it, but getting into a chain like Whole Foods, who, uh, again, serves that customer that would be interested in this was a huge opportunity, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Like, you know, obviously Whole Foods is probably the ideal shopper for us, for us. Um, it, it certainly is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you'll probably know if it's going to work um, at other stores, if it works at whole foods. So right. we got in there, you know, we were really, we we're really the second one on shelf in Canada. And, wow. you know, before we knew it, the first one on the shelf got taken off the shelf. For, so for a while we were the only one there I see. and yeah, like, you know, th thank goodness. Like it was, it was such good timing. We ended right. up having a really good kind of run there for a couple of years, but, but then like any industry, you know, a lot of brands, you know, catch on or, you know, people like me catch on and they start companies. So, um, yeah. you know, while we were the first one in 2017 or 2018, now there's, you know, six or seven of them right beside us. So your, um, your chunk of the pie, uh, gets sliced up pretty, pretty thin. And, you know, you have to really look elsewhere, which what we did, you know, obviously selling online and finding other kind of places to sell it. But I got to think the pie is also growing though, Connor, because more and more people are becoming aware of what it can do for them. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But, but it's, yeah, it's interesting. Like we, we did, we did better in Whole Foods in 2018 than we did in 2021. Interesting. So like it didn't quite grow as fast as the amount of brands they were putting on shelf. And yeah, like we, we certainly, we certainly struggled with that. You know, I'd, every year I'd look and, you know, they'd, they'd put another brand on the shelf next to us. And I would, I would just be like deflated. I, right. you know, cause I, I thought we had a great relationship with them and I was like, Oh, this is great. Like we're, we're, we're their bone broth. And then all of a sudden you realize it's a big, bad world out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. All right. So you've been touching on it, but you developed this formula or initially you were tinkering with this at home or did you right away go to a commercial kitchen uh, tell me a little bit about that process. 
Yeah, it was it was definitely an interesting few months. So when I first found out about it, I was just making it in my apartment, you know, sure. making it, you know, probably like three or four batches a week. And it takes, you know, a full day, 24 hours to make it. So, you know, my whole, all my neighbors, my whole apartment, <laughs> like floor just stunk of, of, of broth, you know, people say it smells great and you know, it, it does smell nice, but when, when, when it's all over your clothes and you can't get it out and it's in the hallway and, uh, it, it, it definitely weighs on you. So I certainly didn't sell anything that was made out of my apartment. I, you know, pretty quickly rented a commercial kitchen and figured out what equipment we needed, bought all that and, um, kept, kept tinkering with it in the commercial kitchen, but, but also, I wasn't afraid to kind of sell it when it, you know, maybe wasn't quite ready, ready for prime time. You know, I think it's really important to just get something to market. And, Absolutely. Um, you know, pe people say the old adage is like, oh, if you're not embarrassed of your first version, then you, you know, you launched it too late. So, um, you know, I was really happy to just get it out there and keep iterating and really just crowdsource the feedback. And, and we still do that today. I mean, we're still And this was at, you know, at local um, farmers markets or places like that or grocery stores that would let you in. Where, where were you getting that feedback and having people sample it? Yeah. So that, that was me just pounding the pavement. So we didn't do farmer's markets because I wanted some time off on the weekends and they're typically on weekends. Right. So I was hitting the, the you know, hitting every store in, in our neighborhood, trying to get it on shelf and, you know, getting introductions to wherever we could. We, we had a great kind of local online uh, delivery service that, you know, took a chance on us. They were our first kind of big account and, I see. you know, so, so lucky that they, they took a chance on us, but also, we were, we were selling direct to consumer in, you know, 2017 when, you know, it was frankly a bit early for a frozen food product to be doing that, but we, we were somehow making it work mostly with local delivery throughout Vancouver. And we, we, we got a decent following because we got some, you know, some media coverage and that, that kind of thing that really like got us our first few customers, but, but we realized pretty quickly that direct to consumer at the time was was difficult and expensive to scale because we could we couldn't make the unit economics work with because, shipping because a it was frozen a frozen product. product yeah exactly yeah. yeah so it's just so tricky and then now when you look at it a few years later you you know some brands are certainly selling shipping frozen products across the country we we're doing that and and you can make it work but but the margins are just like razor thin so that's when you developed the dehydrated powder product yeah it was, it was that's when it started getting in my head but it just took so long. Like we, we just couldn't, we couldn't figure it out. There were some companies, you know, importing. And you were trying to do this yourself or did you by that point have a third party helping you with this? I, we had a few different third parties that were okay. kind of helping chip away at it and helping do some of the manufacturing for us. But yeah, as a, as a bootstrap business, it just got so expensive. So we, that's why it just took so long to figure out. We had really limited budgets. Um, and it, it was tricky because I saw other products get launched, you know, before ours was ready. And I knew that these people were just importing products from overseas and slapping a label on it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, it was hard, a lot of, a lot of FOMO and, you know, a lot of, yeah, just, just difficulties and thinking, Hey, should I raise money or what should we do? We're kind of falling behind. And, um, but we took a more cautious approach. So how did you fund uh, or to date, at least at initial launch and until now, what has been the source of funding? Yeah, it's all been all been self-funded. So, you know, getting getting loans, getting just about every grant available, getting um, any sort of government support or loans from friends and family. That's that's how I've funded it. Obviously, putting you know a lot of my own money in that I've been able to save from working in software. So it's been tricky. Yeah, and you certainly can't grow as quickly as you like sometimes. But um, I would uh, I think it I think it fits my personality a little bit better than going out and raising a bunch of money. And then all of a sudden you're beholden to, you know, a bunch of old, you know, old crusty guys that are uh, <laughs> demanding, you know, a thousand percent returns in a year. So uh, that's kind of the approach I took. Are you profitable now? We are profitable. Yeah. But uh, obviously with, with, yeah, I mean, with any, with any startup or consumer product, you know, a lot of it gets reinvested into either inventory sure. or, you know, growth. So I mean, yeah, we, 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 we certainly can be profitable, I would say, you know, but uh, everything's getting reinvested right now into just growing. How did you get into Whole Foods? What, what did you have to have in place first to get into a large chain? And uh, did they invite you or was it your tenacious efforts to get in there? How, how did you get in there? 
Yeah. Whole foods is a funny story. So I, I think, um, your listeners might, uh, some people might be able to try this and it might still work. I'm not quite sure. So what I did was I noticed there was maybe one bone broth on the shelf at the time. I thought mine was better. This is right when we launched, I started sending, I, I think I picked a week and I, and I sent all my family members and friends to, um, one whole foods in particular, <laughs> and ask them to all speak to the manager and, you know, demand that our product gets placed on the shelf. So that's what they did. My dad was the first one in. He's always our, our biggest ambassador and not, and not where, afraid where, to, where, uh, what, where are we talking about in Vancouver? I don't know if there's, yeah. Foods up there. okay. Got it. Yeah. This, this was a, a Vancouver one. So sent everybody in. Um, and I think it was, you know, a, a good friend of mine went in and, and I think he was able to actually, you know, talk to the right person and, and explain a little bit more about it. And before I knew it, you know, a couple of weeks later, I got a, I got a cold email from someone from a whole foods domain <laughs> and I thought it was a joke. You know, I right. thought someone was, me was messing with me. So I kept checking the spelling and checking the domain and all that. And I was like, oh, this actually is someone from whole foods saying that, uh, they got a lot of, uh, requests in store and that, uh, they wanted to try some samples. Wow. So yeah. So, so, you know, once I realized it was legit, I, uh, you know, put on my, my best shirt and got our samples and, you know, marched up to his office. And, um, I think the first thing he asked me was, Hey, uh, where are your UPCs? And I had no idea what he was talking about <laughs> now for people that aren't you were still consumer... making the stuff yourself in a commercial kitchen or had you already. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Ab oh, absolutely. Wait. So, uh, still had, you know, sticker labels and, and, you know, I didn't know what UPCs are. So these are basically just the barcodes that go on the back of, of any consumer package. We, we certainly didn't have those, but luckily I think, you know, the people at Whole Foods, obviously it's a big company now, but uh, in my experience, they're, they're great people. So he well, they, worked they with have, They've had that history and tradition had, uh, maybe they still do. So that, that was one of the advantages that, that you had there in attacking them with your grassroots efforts. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. They, they, they get it. So, you know, they, I'm sure they've seen a lot of companies like me that don't know what barcodes are. And uh, that they try and, and go huge. Um, okay. So the, the other question often that you get when you go to these guys is how much of this can you produce, right? So what is your capacity? And so uh, how quickly did that become an issue? And is that what led to then, or let me ask you this question, who's, who's making it now, you or a third party? No, we're, we're, we're at a third party. So in 2018, we, uh, transitions to, um, you know, a traditional contract manufacturer, co-packer that, um, it took a while that, you know, it took six months cause they'd never made bone broth before they had the right equipment, but, um, yeah, it's, it's always, it's always difficult to transition cause it's expensive and you probably sure. end up paying more than if you made it yourself, but, uh, you really just need to do that to free up free up my so. time for yeah, sales. So. Especially in that, in that phase, it might be that you bring that back in house eventually, but it seems like that's the right step yeah, as part of past launch, but getting to that next level. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's saves you a lot of headaches. That's for sure. Yeah. All right. I want to go back to one question. You early days, you were selling it online as well. The challenge that I always have is I try to, to give people guidance and even myself in the past is, you know, you put up a website, and you're a needle in a haystack, how did you get traction or did you already have a following or an audience when you put that website up as to people finding you online? How did you get to that point where people were finding you? Yeah, so we were able to get featured in a couple of local newspapers and these, yeah, so so one of them in particular was a connection from from my software days and, you know, Obviously, I'm so lucky that he agreed to try it and write a feature. And that that really got the juices flowing, got us, you know, a nice backlink to our website, kind of legitimized the business a little bit. Now, certainly that obviously dried up and trying to sell online back then was was very difficult. That's why we kind of I pivoted pretty quickly and decided to try the grocery store route because it's like you said, we, we really just didn't have traffic. We didn't have money to spend on, on Facebook ads or anything like that. Now, if you fast forward a few years, I, I started to notice that we were getting some website traffic from search engines and I was trying to figure out where I was coming from. And I, I said, Oh, Hey, it's cause I wrote that article about, you know, the difference between bone broth stock or, or a traditional broth. And that really opened my eyes to the power of, of, you know, 
SEO search engine optimization and, you know, writing quality articles on certain topics to get search traffic. So that is really our strategy now, if you fast forward to today. So I started just repeating that, you know, blog post that I wrote back in 2017 for, for different topics and really just scaled up to before you knew it, you know, now we're publishing two, three long form, like 2000 word articles a week on wow. everything to do with bone broth, everything to do with soup, everything to do with collagen. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of like a, like a publishing machine at this point. And yeah. it really just brings in, you know, it takes a while to work obviously, but you know, you, you have just such a nice stable, um, repeatable uh, traffic source that you don't have to burn money on with Facebook ads. You don't have to always be optimizing things and, and, you know, on the treadmill, I say, but um, yeah, now, now we're getting, you know, 50,000, 60,000 unique visitors a month um, only from search engines. And we'll probably get a hundred thousand by the end of the year. So it's, it's really been a great investment for us. Yeah, that's fantastic. Actually, you have an opportunity there with SEO on relatively, uh, uh, relatively available search uh, words and, and key terms. And, and so you're, you're, you're creating that authority content, the early days, that's brilliant about the PR, right? I think that's my biggest takeaway there is to get that jump started exposure, whether it's through a connection you have or seeking that PR, that was a huge, that was huge for you to jump start that uh, attention and get people to come and check you out. Yeah, absolutely. We certainly wouldn't have probably wouldn't have gotten anywhere without that PR hit. So I think yeah. if, if you can find some sort of interesting angle that hasn't right. been done before with your product, that's really what you need to, yeah. to approach journalists yeah. with. And again, why starting local or at least regionally and leveraging that and that grassroots effort, and then hopefully you have something that is newsworthy and, and you work it until you get that, that early bump in a following online. All right. Uh, we've been chatting about it, obviously, but, but tell me, give me the elevator pitch. Give me the summary on blue, um, on, on bluebird provisions. Did I get that right? Sure. Yeah. yeah, you got it. So, so we make, uh, the most delicious bone broth you've ever tried using ethically sourced ingredients to help you look and feel better. So, so tell me about the ethically our- sourced. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So, so when we first got started, we noticed that a lot of the meat packers were throwing away their bones. They, they didn't have a use for them. So, um, and you know, where the, where the ethics come in is we are specifically supporting farms that raise animals the right way. Now the right way for me means, um, on pasture. So if it's beef, it's, it's grass fed beef. If it's chicken, it's pasture raised, um, you know, humanly raised with, with room to, you know, I, as I say, you know, frolic in the pastures and have space to roam around, um, not, you know, put, you know, stuck in, you know, chicken coops, for example, also, you know, treated the right way. So fed the right way, having, um, you know, time and time and space and, and not in a, in a, in a high stress environment, because a high stress environment is going to make for stressful animals that are going to give you, you know, worse quality meat and bones. So, um, yeah, I think, I think for us, like, you know, having certified organic products and, you know, non GMO products goes a long way, uh, to, to back that up. Um, and if, you know, consumers are looking for products, you know, I would say meat products in particular, um, you really need some sort of third party validation, like an organic or a certified grass fed to really, really back up the sourcing of the brand, because, it's like we said earlier, a lot of brands can make claims, but if there's not some sort of third-party validation, then it's difficult to, to trust those claims. Yeah. And I know you've got a, a special offer for us, a discount uh, that can use at the website, right? That's it. Yeah, exactly. So if your listeners go to bluebirdprovisions.co and uh, click on the bone broth powder, which is at the top there, they can get 15% off any purchase uh by entering the code henry at checkout uh henry in all uppercase excellent we'll have a link to that and we'll include that in the show notes page if you didn't get that so take advantage of that to check this out either because you've been using it before or you want to try it i'm interested in trying it and um and and especially since i have a little better idea now of what it might taste like like i had no idea connor what this thing might taste like but it makes sense that it would taste like chicken broth right um, great. Well, thanks for sharing that. All right. I'm always looking for a book recommendation. Is there a book that comes to mind that you've read recently or in the past that you would recommend? 
Sure thing. A, a couple of years ago, so this is my favorite nonfiction book. It is called The Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. Um, it is a bit of a large book, but if you want to know about, um, you know, consumer psychology, buyer psychology, just how people think, how people work, how people try to persuade you, um, how you can kind of use, um, you know, brain and cognitive processes to your advantage. I would, I would certainly read this book. It is, uh, it's been just like so interesting and inspiring for me. Thanks for that recommendation. I've never had anybody recommend that. I have not read it, so I will put it on my list. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah, my pleasure. Wrap, yeah, absolutely. Let's wrap it up with this last uh, couple of questions. What's one thing you want us to take away from this journey that you've had and the experiences that, that you've learned from launching Bluebird Provisions? What's one thing you want us to take away from this conversation? Yeah, I think I think for you know aspiring business owners or current business owners, I think um, developing a conviction in the product or service that you're selling is is just so important because. If you don't have a, you know, it doesn't have to be a passion, but I, I say conviction, um, you know, someone's going to come along and start a competitive product or service, and they're probably going to outwork you eventually and perhaps succeed because they have the conviction, they have the passion, they're going to put in that extra hour. Whereas if you don't have that, then, you know, you're probably going to clock out early. You're going to let things slip eventually in the long term, and um, you're probably not going to be as successful as someone who does. So you, you don't need to be passionate about what you do, but I think finding an angle or s- some way to develop a, you know, something that really just makes you excited about it is, is really important for longevity. Yeah. I love that. And we, I talk a lot about in this show about this whole, I think is somewhat of a fallacy that you have to find something you're passionate about or you love, and then money will come. I, I don't buy that. I think <laughs> that's not that that's not enough. The business model has to be right. Those kind of things. So so give me a little bit more about what, what does conviction mean to you? Um, how would you describe it as it appeals, as it applies to you? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think conviction for me is about um, just, just confidence and confidence in your mission or confidence in your vision, confidence in your products and products or services and what it can do. And, and really like, being customer centric, it sounds kind of corny, but just, just, just thinking about how you serve them and, um, you know, how you can convert them into, you know, lifelong evangelists and happy customers. So for me, it, it always goes back to that. It always goes back to, you know, serving them and, and thinking about what products or services they want and, you know, having a community and having, you know, best in class customer service. I think that all, that all stems from, you know, my conviction with, with the product in particular and the, and the community that we're, we're growing and serving. Yeah, well said. Tell us again where you want us to go online to learn more. Yeah. Bluebirdprovisions.co. And um, if you want to get in touch with me, it's connor.bluebirdprovisions.co. Wonderful. Connor, great conversation. Thanks for sharing so, so transparently uh, about your journey and uh, about sharing it, you know, it's very infectious. And so thanks for being with me today and sharing your story. Thanks so much, Henry. That was a pleasure. This is Henry Lopez. And thanks for joining me on this episode of The How of Business. My guest today again was Connor Meekin. I release new episodes every Monday morning and you can find the show anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and at my website, thehowofbusiness.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to The How of Business. For more information about our coaching programs, online courses, show notes pages, links, and other resources, please visit thehowofbusiness.com.